Yes, in the back. And I'll, I'll repeat if you can't hear in the back. So um, it started off as an exploration of forms, so it was much more conceptual. So this is about the, we're, it's still a very, very new piece. Um, so it's still kind of growing and morphing. But what we found is that it's a story about the feminine. So it's very much about the male gaze and a time when women were very much trapped in flat screens, in the silver screen and sized television sets. And now they come, my too buzzy? And now they're coming out and breaking out into the full dimensionality of what it is to be in the feminine. So we're at this time in history where we're seeing that in VR and AR, and we're seeing women that are authoring and creating these technologies. And I'm using a 19th century non-digital device that was invented at the time of the suffragists to have that um, exploration. You know, I'd love to draw you out a little bit on your practice as a shadow artist. Um, can you tell us about what drew you to this practice, and, and what are your what are your interests in in shadow and analog? Yes. So um, I began as a video editor a very long time ago, and I hated being alone and uh, with the machine. And that was a long time ago, and it took like ten minutes for a cross dissolve to render. So it was a very boring thing to do, but I love compositing for a frame. And I had a dream about shadows. I found a shadow theater company in San Francisco. I traveled to Bali and I studied Wayang Kulit, which is in uh, traditional Indonesian shadow theater. And just every time I've tried to walk away, it always comes back to shadows. So I just find there's something so mythological and um, deeply um, satisfying for our psyche that um, I can't stop creating with it. So my other work is very much, is very cinematic and that there's cross dissolves and close ups and long shots, but it's all done panning the light through small objects and cross dissolving sometimes up to 15 lights to make something that feels like a 20 by 40 foot wide film with dancers and performers and sometimes puppets. Have you been working with like 3D shadows, the stereoscope? Because you know, there's such a rich uh, history of shadow play and within the cinematic frame, what, what brought you to bring these shadows out to engulf us? So I'd heard about the shadow scope, but I'd never seen it. So it was like, after working with shadows for over a decade, I was like, wow, like, there are 3D shadows. I'd never seen it before, but um, I read about it and I started to make one. Um, started a lot of fires um, at CalArts <laughs> when I was a student. But eventually we isolated the 3D shadow and I was able, it's very satisfying to me because it felt like my shadow reached out and gave me a big hug. And um, you know, it's just, it, I've been using the shadows 3D in scenes and I've used it for installation. This is the first time that I've wanted to make a full piece really just with this form. Uh, here's a cat fly, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, no, it's the same for me too. So there's like a time when I'm like, oh, now it's really starting to kick. So it's sort of like coming on to like a hallucinogenic experience. So I tried to milk more time in darkness. With a Sundance crowd, I didn't want to make you guys sit in the dark for as long as I would maybe a fine arts crowd. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the darkness. Sorry. <laughs> that makes sense. And then there's a little more time with the cube. So normally we milk that opening section for a lot longer to adjust our eyes to the dark. And a lot of that choreography in the beginning too is just that kind of like, and we're and they're still kind of mechanical because it's sort of this idea that they've just come out of um, one way of being, so they're not fully formed. But yeah, and then later on when we get to the, the squares, I think our eyes are a little, uh, taxed by watching the 3D, so that's why I start to separate it out a little bit around that time. So yeah, I'm thinking about the physiology of, of, of our sight as well. Uh, so gentleman in the blue shirt, yes. The audio. Yes. So as you're creating the audio, how that mixes in with the visual, how you put that together. Can you speak to the audio? Yes, the audio. So um, the composition, our composer will be here for the next show. Um, he um, is my friend Daniel Corral. 
And so he created almost all of the sound and the music. And sometimes I'll use live instrumentation because it warms up the shadows, because it is kind of a cold form. It's, it's not, you know, it's very, it's, it's very black and white. Um, so sometimes I use a lot more strings to kind of warm it up. But this really felt right for this piece. And there's two tracks by um, Caitlin Roy Smith and Moraji. We, I think we kind of get into a more luxurious feminine sound, and then we're sort of back into a little bit more of the mechanical. So that's kind of how we've tracked it. And um, I work this time with Daniel's existing tracks, but sometimes we create together hand in hand. Uh, yes, and then we can come. Uh, speak to the choice of uh, having the three feminine figures look very similar. Um, no, because um, this is the third time we've done it, and it's been with different performers each time. So it's um, they've always been of different um, ethnicities and shapes the other times. This is sort of just how it wound up. And then when I see this with these women, I am thinking more about like that 50s like silver screen idea, so we put in some of those Maryland moments. But um, yeah, that's not in intentional, and I think to develop an hour long piece, I would be much more mindful of that. You three were the best. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, there's all the way in the back, the blue, yes. Yes, so it's a very simple concept. So there's a red and a blue light, two different lights, one's red, one's blue, and then your eyes are covered with red and blue gels. So it's a very old anaglyph idea. Um, so in the, in the 19, 1900s is when the shadow scope was made, but the magic lantern dating all the way back to like 14th century, people were putting colored gels over lanterns and starting to experiment with this idea. So it's, it's, it's really ancient. Um, yeah, I just kind of put some gels over some lights and it worked. Um, I've never seen anyone cast, the shadows, so normally the show is 40 feet tall, so we adjusted it for the state, the, the Egyptian, but um, I don't know anyone else who's creating at that scale in 3D. But it's really, it's, uh, I don't know, I think it reached out pretty far, but there's something when it's like huge that it's even more powerful in some ways. Yeah. And we have some time, uh, just two questions. One here in the back. Yes, uh, you're turning around now, it's you, yes. <laughs> What is the future of this, this work, this art? Um, so there's two ways that I really like to see this happen, and one is in a large-scale gallery space where people are invited to come up and see their own 3D shadows. So I really, really like when people can come and play in the form as well, because that's what I really enjoy. So seeing you know a, a person reach and like see their hand come at them is very satisfying for me, especially for adults. So I love when it's an open installation, and then I love when it's enlivened kind of every you know, half hour, hour, where the dancers come in and perform, and then step away and let people play again. So that's sort of my favorite back and forth with it. But I also want to take it into an hour long piece, because what's really fun is when there are shadows behind the screen, and you see the um, dance in flat shadows, as I call them, and the liberated shadows, dancing together and having that tension of the ones that can reach and the ones that are trapped. So there's a lot of, there's a lot more story points that can be developed over an hour long piece. And there's one in the front. Yes. I was just about to ask about rear projection, but you kind of answered it with that question, or with that answer. Can I talk about the projection? Yes, um, rear projection. So most shadow performers in the world have the shadow light behind them. Um, I was trained in Indonesia, so there's both. So in Indonesia, when you go to see a Wayang Kulit performance, you can watch from the front and just live in the mystery of the shadows, or you can walk around to the back and you can see the coconut oil flame and the dalang and the puppets 
and gamelan. So I really like to play, I, I love that so much when I was in Bali, I love watching the performer. So that's why I've turned it this way so we can all watch it. Some people are like, what's all that crap in the way? You know, they don't like that. But um, ideally, uh, people could walk all the way around and see it from both sides. It's also really fun sometimes when it is rear projected or rear cast because the objects really hover out in a different space without seeing the um, lights also in, in the foreground. Yeah. Okay, we might have run out a bit of time for this part of it. Um, but let's give another round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>